So we have actually entered into an era of information. And in the last session, we were discussing about two important components of this information age. The first was the transmitter part, and the second was the receiver part. In the transmitter part, we have the photonic equipments like uh, LED, light emitting diodes, and semiconductor lasers. And on the other side, the receiver side, we have, for example, a detector, photo detectors, either a PN junction photodiode or pin photodiode, and there are thousand other possibilities. Now, today, we are going to discuss about the channel uh, connecting these two particular sessions, the receiver unit and uh, the uh, transmitter unit and the receiver unit of this uh, photonic revolution or information revolution. Now, we are very proud to say that uh, an Indian has contributed, uh, Indian is called the, the father of this particular uh, optical fiber, and he has coined the, a word, a term to describe this technology, fiber optics. So he uh, was a Punjabi person, and he migrated to uh, England for his studies. The Imperial College ordered in 1952. He developed this particular concept. And he did a lot of experiments on uh, this, uh, uh, some fibers, inspired a very old idea by John Tyndall. What John Tyndall observed was the possibility of bending light, light being bent when it's passing through a water jet. So the fundamental idea is something which is well known. You have studied in small classes, there could be total internal reflection. Uh, when uh, a light is traveling from, two conditions we have already defined for total internal reflection in small classes. The first condition is that light should travel from a denser medium to a rarer medium. So let's draw that. Let's imagine you have a medium N1 and medium N2, whose interface is uh, this line. And under the condition, N1 is greater than N2, which means this is optically denser region, this is optically rarer medium. Now, if you allow a light to fall on this interface, you know there will be an angle created here. This is called angle of... Uh, Incidence, let's imagine this angle of incidence is less than a critical uh, angle, theta c. Then this particular light, though this is being rarer, it will be bending away from the normal, no, away from the normal, so it will be bending like this. So this is the angle of uh, refraction. Obeying uh, the famous law, which we all know, this is Snell's law. So there will be two medium and two angles. This is angle of uh, uh, refraction, theta r. And now, if you uh, consider a greater angle for incidence, let's say this is happening here, and let's say this particular angle, theta i, angle of incidence is equal to a particular angle which we call critical angle. I will come to that, where it is called critical angle. So this particular ray will be making an angle of refraction, which is 90 degree, which means the light does not pass through the uh, rarer medium, rather it will be grazing the interface between this medium. And that happens at a particular angle which we name critical angle. And this is important to understand what is critical. When we use the word critical in physics, it means there is a total change in the phenomena. We have seen the first uh, sessions. We spoke about, for example, critical temperature or critical field with respect to superconductivity. And we know these two, uh, critical temperature and critical field. This speaks about a pace change from a normal conducting state to superconducting state. And when we discuss about the uh, LED and semiconductor laser, we found a critical current. And that current was 
a critical uh, point where led becomes a semiconductor laser which means the linear increase in the power which is characteristic of a led which will be changed over to exponential uh, explosion of the power which is characteristic of a laser so similarly here you know so far we were using the laws of refraction the loss of refraction as you know is the snell's law and you know that is n1 sin theta r is equal to n2 n1 sin theta i is equal to n2 sin theta r that is going to be the snell's law and now let's imagine what what will happen if you increase this angle this is angle of incidence once again but in this case it is greater than theta c a critical angle now the phenomena changes so far the phenomena was refraction now from now on the the law will be law of reflection so which means what is law of reflection angle of incidence will be angle of equal to angle of reflection so oh, i use same words or reflection reflection so there is a total change in phenomena so that is why this particular angle is now called a critical angle this is an angle below which or at at which at which there is a change of physical law of light the physical law till here was a refraction now from now on this uh, this particular uh, ray light ray will obey the law of reflection so i just wanted to bring you uh, to the use of the uh, the meaning of the use of the word critical in physics so uh, in this particular sessions we use that uh, many a time that's why i just want to uh, specify that now there's something very fantastic uh, in this from this uh, uh, picture you can imagine you can already see uh, the light is traveling from a denser medium to rarer medium so corresponding to your idea about the conditions of total in, total in and reflection so the first condition was that light travels from a denser to rarer medium and second one was that the angle of incidence uh, at this interface should be a angle greater than critical angle if that both conditions are satisfied we say that total internal reflection will happen and this is therefore which this means that light will not any more enter this particular second medium light will remain in this particular medium which is called n1 this is a fantastic idea so you get an idea how to confine light how to guide light through a particular channel that is important concept which we get by this total lens reflection so our narendra singh kapani he was very successful engineer with more than 100 patents in this particular area now he uh, understood the power of this particular idea and he already developed something which i am going to draw this is what is called the basic structure of a optical fiber so we have for example a, a region which you call optical core with higher value of refractive index n1 and you have a surrounding you, you should imagine this is a three dimensional structure so this is a, a, a wire like stuff so you have now cladding which is having a refractive index which is uh, less, smaller than this so n1 greater than n2 now let's say this is the axis of this particular optical fiber now if you send a light to this in such a way that at this particular interface between core and cladding uh, the angle of incidence is greater than critical angle then what will happen light will total internally reflect not just once here again the same condition will be met conditions for total internal reflection so it will be reflecting back and like this multiple total internal reflection will be there and the light will be entirely confined in this particular channel which we call core so confinement of light into the optical core of the optical uh, fiber
interesting idea that uh, Narendra Singh Kapal had. He even, in, in his days, he could even allow a image to, to be transmitted through optical fiber. The information about an image could be, he could transmit through this optical fiber. So that is a very wonderful achievement by an Indian. Uh, but there was a major problem. The major problem was that the light which is passing through this optical fiber core was get lost very soon. Its intensity got lost, which means there was a lot of attenuation losses for this light. So the maximum distance could uh, transmit this particular information 20 meters. Now, there was another important person which is called, whose name is Charles Kao. He was working in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And he started working already in 1960s. And in his lifetime, he achieved a tremendous improvement for this distance of transmission. From 20 meters, he made it 100 kilometers. So there's a big achievement this man has made. And rightly, he has got Nobel Prize uh, in, uh, in this, uh, for this uh, improvement. He got Nobel Prize uh, in 2009. Very recently, he got Nobel Prize. He died already. But Narendra Singh lives. Uh, Narendra Singh, uh, Singh did not get Nobel Prize. He's an unsung hero in this uh, technology. But at the same time, Charles Kao made a, a real breakthrough. He could be called maybe the godfather of broadband, the current technology. The technological level of this fiber optics was drastically improved by Charles Kao. What he found was interesting. You know, I have already mentioned there is a core and cladding. Now, he found that. The major reason for the loss of intensity uh, when light passes through the optical fiber core is the purity of the material used here. The glass material, generally the glass materials are used. So if you could improve the purity, the intensity losses or attenuation losses can be drastically reduced. That is how he could uh, allow the light to travel long distances without much intensity losses or attenuation losses. So, these uh, names you should remember. Therefore, when we think about fiber optics, we have Narayan Singer Kapani, an Indian, and John Tintar was inspiring him, and Charles Kao good Nobel Prize. So we start with the Nobel Prize winner to be inspired uh, in, to understand this particular uh, technology, which is called the op fiber optics. Uh, let us now discuss about the numerical aperture of an optical fiber. You know, numerical aperture is a quantity which is not specific to optical fiber. It is a general term which is used for all kind of optical instruments. Essentially, it is the ability of that particular optical instrument to gather light. Light gathering capacity on a, of that optical instrument. In, in our case, it is the light gathering capacity of the optical fiber. This is very important to know because of the optical information this particular optical fiber has to carry later on. We will come to that uh, later, uh, later. Now let's derive a simple expression for numerical aperture for an optical fiber. As we have already discussed, we have optical fiber fundamentally made of a, a core, which is having greater value for refractive index, surrounded by a cladding, which is having a lower value for refractive index. And this is the optical fiber axis. Now, let's imagine the surrounding medium is the ambient. So there is a ambient has a refractive index. It could be ambient, it could be air, any other medium oil, water, whatever it be. They generally call it uh, ambient. And you know the minimum condition of confinement of light in the optical core, that is what we actually want, is that at this particular uh, point, the 
the ray that is entering this particular optical fiber should at least graze the interface between the core and cladding. That's the minimum condition for confinement. Let's start from there. And if that is happening, we know this particular angle is 90 degree angle of refraction. Let's come back, let's just draw it back. So, which means, you know, you can have a, uh, here corresponding angle will be critical angle. We have already seen that when the angle of incidence at a part particular interface is at XC, this particular refractor ray will be grazing the interface. So that is the condition we are deriving. So you can imagine this angle is 90 degree. And let's say this is alpha prime, some, some uh, value. But this light has to be input from outside, from the ambient, to this optical fiber. So let's uh, re trace it back. You know, this is a, uh, let's suppose this medium is a rarer medium, and this here is optical fiber core, which is a denser medium. So of course, then we find a bending towards this, uh, uh, this particular uh, act uh, the, uh, uh, the normal at the point of incidence, that this is the normal, which we call the axis of the optical fiber, is the normal at the point of incidence. Now we, we get an idea about a maximum uh, angle, which is acceptable uh, to be, uh, to send this light to this optical fiber core with the minimum expectation that this particular light will at least grace the interface of core and cladding. So this is a maximum because if you just imagine if you are sending a ray which is having a greater angle than this, then what will happen here is that it will be leaking into the optical uh, cladding. So this is something which we don't want to have. So this is the maximum angle so we have a maximum angle here, which, is, which we can call alpha m. This is generally called Mac acceptance angle, uh, fiber acceptance angle. So if light is falling at least this particular angle or lower values, that is the acceptable angle. And you should also imagine that this particular uh, structure, we have made it a two-dimensional picture, but it's in fact a three-dimensional uh, material. It's a, it's a, wire-like stuff. Therefore, you could imagine this particular angle is not a plane angle, rather a angle of a cone. Uh, in fact, a half conical angle. This is the full cone. You have a full cone here where the light could enter. Now, this will be half conical angle. So we are discussing about a fiber acceptance angle, which means, as I told you, that's the maximum value of the angular incidence uh, from the ambient. If you send the light, send the light information into this particular optical fiber at this angle, there's a minimum uh, condition uh, for being confined, that particular light being confined in this particular optical fiber core. So from this understanding, let's uh, try to uh, define what is called uh, derive an expression for numerical aperture. As I told you, numerical aperture is the ability, it measures the ability of this optical fiber right now to gather light. And you know, we have two interfaces to consider where refraction is taking place. Let's consider right to start with ambient core interface. So which means this interface. So ambient core interface. Now, you have a Snell's law there, and Snell's law will be Na, that's the refractiveness of the ambient, sine alpha m is equal to refractiveness of the core, N1, and the angle of refraction here in the denser medium, sine alpha prime. 
Now you know the total angle of a triangle is uh, 180. You have 90 here, and uh, this angle should share 90. So therefore, alpha prime will be 90 minus theta c. So you can write equivalently, this is equal to n1 sine 90 minus theta c. So sine 90 minus theta c, as you know, this is uh, cos theta c. So n1 cos theta c. Now cos theta c you can write in terms of sine theta c as n1 square root of 1 minus sine square theta c. And there is a purpose, you know, Snell's law will be always containing sine. So therefore, you can have uh, the definition for theta c, sine theta c from the second interface. So let's go to the second interface. So that is the interface between core and cladding. Let's write uh, the same uh, Snell's law for crow core cladding interface. So you can easily see that the Snell's law will be n1 sine theta c. This is the angle of uh, angle of incidence at uh, the uh, interface between core and cladding will be equal to N2, which is the refractive of the cladding, sine 90. Sine 90 because, you know, this is the uh, condition for gracing the interface. So sine 90 is 1, and therefore sine theta C will be, sine theta C will be nothing but N2 minus N1. Substituting here, you will get this is equal to n1 square root of, you can uh, take it to the, so 1 minus n2 square minus n1 square, which is, you can, you can bring the n1 here, n1 square will be cancelling with the n1 in the uh, outside. So therefore, you'll get this is equal to square root of n1 square minus n2 square. So this is uh, the expression for n a sin alpha m. Now we know how we define the uh, numerical aperture. Numerical aperture is defined as a sine function of this particular fiber acceptance angle, which is the alpha m. So what you have numerical aperture is sin alpha m. It is here, therefore you can write numerical aperture is equal to square root of n1 square minus n2 square divided by n a. So you can see, easily see, the numerical aperture is a, a function of core refractive index, cladding refractive index, and the refractive index of the ambient. And let's imagine the ambient is air, which is the normal, the, normally the case. So in that particular case, it will be equal to n1 square minus n2 square. You can see right as n1 plus n2 into n2. So, which means the refractiveness of the core and cladding will radically determine the fiber acceptance angle and the sign of that fiber acceptance angle, which is numerical aperture. Which means something interesting that you cannot put light at any desired angle. There is a, the mouth of the optical fiber is not uh, open, 90 degree like uh, the mouth of a crocodile. Rather it will be open with a minimum opening will be there. You can imagine you, are, uh, you have a friend, you want to throw chocolates into his mouth and he cannot catch all these chocolates because his mouth is not infinitely open. There's an angle for the opening, maybe 20 degree, 30 degree, that's the maximum it can be open. So is an optical fiber. If you want to input a lot of information into this optical fiber, it is not possible that, the, you should imagine that this optical fiber is incapable of receiving it if, uh, because it cannot open its mouth greater than alpha m in such a way that the light will be able to uh, be captured and propagated through the optical fiber core or confine uh, the light to the optical fiber core. So this is the basic concept of optical fiber right now. And in, in fact, I've done an experiment in this regard in the lab. So uh, we have, we know uh, uh, the refractive index of the 
usually uh, the technical information about an optical fiber, give you the values of the refractiveness of the core and refractiveness of the cladding. So you can easily calculate the numerical aperture using this expression n1 square minus square root of n1 square minus n2 square. So it's very easy. But you know, the measurement of n1 and n2 is very tricky because its difference will be very small only. Therefore, practically, if you calculate like this, it may not be uh, really uh, applicable in practice. So therefore, what we do is that we just send light and uh, at the output, uh, output side, uh, you can have a, uh, you can put a, a screen where a, uh, a circle, will, uh, a cross section of this optical fiber cone will be made which will be having a uh, shape of a circle. So from that, you can easily add, uh, calculate the fiber acceptance angle. You know, let's say this is the fiber acceptance angle. This is the alpha m, the maximum angle. And let's say this particular uh, circle, which is a cross section, which is a trace of uh, this cone on a, on a uh, surface. Uh, the radius is r. And let's say the distance between this optical fiber core and this particular screen which you have put is L. So you can have uh, alpha m is equal to tan inverse of r by L. But you know generally angles are small, so you can even write this is equal to r by L. And you can uh, calculate alpha m, and you can calculate uh, sign of this alpha m, which is nothing but the numerical aperture. So you can practically measure this uh, uh, numerical aperture in the lab, and you are already doing this particular experiment in the lab. So let me uh, tell you a few more things in this uh, connection. We have seen uh, uh, a particular minimum condition. This is the minimum condition for opening of this optical fiber core for propagation of this uh, uh, light through this optical fiber core, confined to the optical fiber core. Now let's see what will happen uh, when the angles are, for example, greater than that we have already seen. If the angle of uh, this cone is greater than, if you throw uh, information into this particular op optical fiber core at an angle greater than alpha m, what happens is clear. We have already seen that. The light will be refracted in, at this interface between ambient and core, and it will be again refracted at the core cladding interface, and it will be leaking. Leaking to the cladding. Leaking to the cladding means that information is lost. Intensity of light is lost. And this particular uh, information is lost. Attenuation loss will be happening. So we, we have, cannot accept that, because uh, we want this light to be confined and uh, propagated through this optical fiber for long distances. So the minimum condition is that the alpha m. So what will happen? It will grace this particular light will be gracing the, 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 the interface between core and cladding, which is acceptable. Now let's say uh, we are, that this particular angle is zero, which means that is passing through the optical fiber axis. So that is an uh, excellent thing uh, because there is no refractions, nothing happening. This is uh, no, falling normal to this and will be passing through. Okay. To the, or through the optical fiber axis. Now let's take an angle very close to this uh, uh, axis. What will happen is that, you know, it will take long paths like this, very few number of reflections, and therefore light will be passing through the optical fiber core. And now let's take another case which is very close to alpha m. What happens is that light will make a lot more uh, uh, reflections total then reflections before it is leaving the, uh, 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 this is the way it will be propagated through the optical fiber. So there are three uh, possibilities, three types of uh, possibilities. So you can name this, uh, this particular, uh, uh, there, there are different optical paths to the optical fiber core. So you can say there is a axial mode. To start with, axial mode, mode means a path. So there is a path through the axis, okay? A path through the axis. And second one is as a very closer to the axis, which is making very few reflections and for passing through, which means this is uh, making a lower order 
ഓർഡർ മൂഡ് സോ ദിസ് എ ആൻഡ് ദ ടൈപ്പ് ഓഫ് പാത്ത് വൺ ദ ഫസ്റ്റ് ടൈപ്പ് ഓഫ് പാത്ത് ഈസ് ദ ആക്സിയൽ മൂഡ് ജിസ് പാസ് ഇസ് ദ ആക്സിസ് ഓഫ് ഒപ്റ്റിക്കൽ ഫൈബർ and which is very close to the axis which makes few number of uh, reflections for uh, propagation so a lower order mode other one which is very close to the uh, alpha m it makes large number of uh, uh, internal reflections for passing so you can call is higher order mode so there are three uh, types of paths so in fact axial mode is just one mode but lower order modes and higher order modes there are different uh, numbers for that but there is a typical characteristic for this you can understand the axial mode will be the shortest path the shortest path will be axial mode for propagation and the the lower order mode which is very starting very closer to this particular axis will be in between path that in, in with respect to distance will be in between and you have a longer uh, the higher order mode which is being large number of reflections for propagation which means that path will be the longest so you have the shortest path through the axis the longest path for the higher order mode and in between a medium path uh, through the lower order modes so now this is interesting to observe because you know we have to consider what kind of information you are giving going to give to this optical fiber you know in the digital era uh, the information is everything digital we have electrical uh, uh, bits for example we say there is a zero and one electrically it means zero means a low voltage and one means a high voltage so every information we will be converting to zeros and ones and zero once again this is the lower voltage and one is the higher voltage now when it comes to the optical digital communication we should think about optical bits what is optical bit optical zero is off no light off and optical one is on so which mean what we what kind of information we are going to give to the optical fiber mouth on off on off or off on a series of zeros and ones every time zero is off one is on now we should imagine what will happen to this light which is entering to this uh, optical fiber core on on off on off such information when light is on you should imagine that on the light travels through different paths there's a shortest path light travels longest path higher order mode in between lower order mode so light on when it is on light travels through different paths what's the problem then if travels long distances you can imagine we speak about kilometers there will be there will be a problem a critical problem which means you are off and on will be mutually confusing because you know one part of the on is traveling through axial mode they will be traveling faster another part is traveling through a, a lower order mode which is uh, in in medium uh, path and another one is another part of the this this on information is passing through the higher order mode so there will be a flattening effect for this particular uh, on a pulse so flattening means it will be looking like a zero you cannot any more distinguish between zeros and ones this is what is the major problem for the optical fiber communication so this is called uh, uh, the dispersion losses dispersion losses means you cannot any more distinguish between zeros and ones they are all a general lighting will be there so information will be washed out so you cannot allow the information to be washed out because that is the core what we want to uh, get transmitted through the optical fiber core so therefore you cannot uh, afford it to uh, go to that particular level and therefore care must be care must be taken for uh, avoiding this kind of problem so i just conclude by saying we have discussed about numerical aperture light gathering capacity and we have derived a half conical angle at the optical fiber mouth or optical fiber end both are e- equivalent 
for an optical fiber, mouth and the end, or both are equivalent. So uh, this is acceptable angle uh, for optical fiber uh, uh, transmission or uh, propagation of light through the optical fiber core. Now we also discussed about different possibilities. If uh, the light enters this particular optical fiber at a greater angle, alpha m, they get lost. Intensity losses or attenuation losses will happen. Now, the region between zero and alpha m, that is the only possibility. So, you know, but there is an axis, the zero angle is the shortest path, and uh, uh, longest path will be the higher order mode, which is very closer to the alpha m, and uh, lower order mode is also there, which is uh, a medium path. But the problem right now is to receive this optical, uh, when re on receiving on off information, information can be flattened, or information can be get lost as a general illumination, so which will be, cannot be afforded. So these are the important points we should uh, uh, take care when we discuss about uh, numerical aperture and uh, fiber, uh, fiber. So now let's discuss about uh, the different types of optical fibers which are available. OFC is the name it is shortened uh, called optical fiber kerbal. So OFCs can be of different types. These types are distinguished by the, the distribution of the refractive index for the core and cladding, and with the number of modes. I have already explained the meaning of the mode and number of paths through the optical fiber. Now let's start with what we have in the middle. This is what is called step index multi-mode optical fiber. So by step index, we mean the core cladding, uh, core and cladding refractive index will be both constants. There will be one value, higher value for the core refractive index and one lower value for the core cladding refractive index. So N1 and N2 are constants and therefore, when we draw the profile of the refractive index, starting from the axis of this optical fiber where we put zero, and we move in the radial distance, we find this is the function drawn as a function of the refractive index. You have a constant value for the refractive index of the core, a higher value, and a lower constant value for the refractive index of the cladding. So this look like a step, a step. That is why this particular uh, type of optical fiber cable, OFC, is called step index optical fiber. Now, this is also called multi-mode due to one important reason. So you can see this particular uh, optical fiber core will be having approximately 50 micrometer, which means rather, rather large uh, uh, core. The large core also means that depending on the alpha m, that there could be different types of modes, different types of paths through this optical fiber core. There could be a, a path through the axis of the core, as we have already seen, and higher order mode, which is near to the alpha m, and uh, a lo a lower order mode, which is uh, 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 with incidence angle, which is closer to the axis. So different types of modes will be there. Large number of modes, large number of optical paths will be there through the optical fiber. And I have already told you, this is not going to be a, a positive thing for optical fiber. If there are large number of paths like that, if you have an on signal coming, one coming, what will happen? one part of this particular signal will be traveling through the axial mode with the shortest path, and another part of the same signal will be traveling through the longest path, which is defined by higher order mode, and yet another part of the signal will be traveling through the lower order mode. So which means the same signal is traveling through different paths which are having different lengths. So therefore, at the end of this particular optical fiber, after a short distance, what will happen? There will be only general illumination. The signal, the, dig, the bit, the data 
is lost, the information is lost, which we cannot afford because this is communication where the signals are important and signals uh, has to keep their shape. Whether it is one, it is one, it is, we should be able to distinguish between zeros and ones, which will not be made allowed if there is a lot of dispersions, loss of shape, flattening of these uh, pulses as they travel different distances in time. So, this is technically very easy to make because of this core diameter which is large. To develop a core diameters, uh, optical fibers with the core diameters large is easier. The technology challenge will be to reduce this uh, optical fiber core diameter so that it can avoid all these different modes. So not everywhere that we have, if you have many, uh, it is advantages for us. If you have multi-mode, this is having, a, uh, giving a disadvantage for us. And because of this particular problem, we'll be challenged to reduce the number of bits which has, can be passed to this particular uh, step index multi-mode optical fiber. Because in order to be able to distinguish between on and off, one, uh, optical one and optical zero, we we'll have to introduce uh, bit intervals. So some region, so you have one and an interval, then zero, and then one like that, you know. So you cannot, you cannot propagate, we cannot put input a signal at any rate. So therefore, the bit rate will be suffering, and generally, uh, the bit rate which can be passing through a step index multimode optical fiber will be less than 500 Mbps, Mbps, uh, M megabits per second, Mbps. This is something which you already know. So, therefore, to, to overcome this technological barrier, the immediate thing we could think about is to reduce the core diameter. So, let's say we are going to reduce a core diameter to, for example, 10 micrometer five times smaller. So such kind of optical fibers are called step index single mode optical fiber, which means that no different types of modes are allowed anymore. Rather, one single mode is allowed to pass to this optical fiber core, and that path, mode means path, that path will be the axial path, axial mode. So light will be traveling only through the axial mode, the advantage being since there are no different paths with the different lengths and different transit times, the shape of the pulse will be intact. Which means if you give a pulse on, optical on, it will be optical on, through and through. Because there is no flattening of this pulse, loss of shape of this pulse. So you can, therefore, it will be possible for you to give large bit rates large number of bits can be passed through this particular optical fiber core. Generally, the bit rate will be greater than one gigabits per second. So great bit rates can be achieved. We just reduce this, uh, uh, the diameter of the optical fiber core. But you know, it's a technical challenge because you know, you should imagine 10 micrometer means much smaller, thinner than your hair. So the production of it, the manufacturing or the technology behind it will be very complicated and it will be extremely expensive because of that. Therefore, wherever possible we have to modify this kind of uh, optical fiber, uh, uh, this uh, optical fiber core in order to achieve the same effect. For example, can we somehow without reducing the diameter of the optical fiber core, is it possible for us to achieve the equalization of the transit time? And that is achieved by a greater index optical fiber, where you have uh, the same core diameter, say 50 micrometer, but you are making a small modification. The modification being, it's a, the index of the, the refractive index of the core is having a 
a, a parabolic uh, structure, which means along the axis, it will be achieving maximum value. So refractive index is uh, defined as a function of radial distance. When radial distance, this is zero, radial distance is zero, it will be having maximum value. And it moves from axial axis, which is at zero, in the radi along the radial distance to the uh, core cladding interface, refractive index is gradually decreasing, which means the shortest path, which is the axial path, will be having greatest value for the refractive index. So in other words, the shortest path will be the slowest path. You know, the speed of light will be depending on the refractive index. And if the refractive index is very high and maximum, that path will be the slowest. Axial path, axial mode is the shortest path. But that shortest path will be having greater value for the refractive index and it will be slowest path. Now, I have already told you another types of paths, higher order paths and lower order paths. Higher order paths will be making large number of reflections and it will be closing uh, very much this region between, uh, near to the core cladding interface. And that path is longest path. But you know, near the core cladding interface, the refractive index is very small. So in other words, the longest path will be the fastest path. The shortest path is the slowest, and the shortest path, the longest path will be the fastest, which creates a, 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 a situation that whichever path you take, that there will be the transit time of the pulse. For example, if you give a one here, it will be transiting through this optical fiber core at the same time. There's an equalization of the transit time. And that is another way, an ingenious way to, to avoid intermodal dispersion, which is very much there in the step index multimode optical fiber. So this is a, a brilliant idea. So in order, uh, we don't wa want to reduce the diameter of the core, rather we make this uh, uh, the core as a greater index. So we give a greater index profile. Greater index means maximum value we give to the optical fiber core and gradually decreasing value for the refractive index for the, so refractive index will be a function of uh, R, a decreasing function of R. So as the R increases, refractive index decreases. So this is a ingenious idea. So the technical difficulty of making the core diameter smaller is avoided, but new technology, new technological challenge is coming here, additional technological challenge. There'll be smooth variation of this particular refractive index, keeping maximum value for the, the axial mode, axial path. And as we move away radially to the core cladding, cladding interface, the value of the refractive index would be gradually decreasing. Stop. So we have already seen uh, the uh, refractive index profiles of this particular uh, different types of optical fibers. Now let's see how I've just verbally mentioned now pictorially, let us see what is actually happening uh, within this uh, uh, multi-mode step index optical fiber, single mode step index optical fiber, and uh, greater index uh, multi-mode multi optical fiber. So in the step index multi-mode optical fiber, as I've told you, there are different types of modes. The axial mode is the shortest path. And a path very closer to alpha m, the fiber acceptance angle, it will be making large number of total line reflections at different points for propagation, which will itself make a, the longest path. And another types, type of uh, optical path is very closer to the angle of uh, incidence is very small and very close to the axis. So you can see that it will make very few total down reflections or propagation. So that will be creating a, a medium path. So they are not just one, uh, three, rather three types of 
types of modes, types of path. Axial mode is one, but higher order mode and lower order mode are large in number. So the problem here, as I've told you, the light, the optical uh, data, optical data is uh, zeros and ones, on, off, one and zero, on, off. Now let's say the on information, one pulse is divided into different paths. One part of the pulse is, will be traveling through the optical fiber axis. Another part of the pulse will be choosing the higher order mode. And yet another uh, part, uh, part of this uh, signal will be carried by the lower order mode. So therefore different paths and therefore the, the bit will be stretched and it will just get a general illumination and the distinguishability of zeros and ones will be lost, which in effect is the loss of information which cannot be afforded. Therefore what we do is that between these bits we get a, give a extra interval and therefore the net interval, net bits which, can, which we can pass through this particular uh, step index multi-mode optical fiber will be always less than 500 megabits per second. But that problem, as I told you, is solved by reducing the core diameter, maybe five times smaller. Here it was 50 micrometer, and here it is 10 micrometer. Then we could eliminate all other modes, excepting the axial mode. So there'll be only one path. And then their uh, pulse, whether it is on or off, will be clearly, distinguishably passing through this optical fiber. Therefore, we need not, uh, uh, there's an intermodal dispersion or the broadening of pulse due to uh, different paths. That problem is solved here. And therefore, we can really go beyond one gigabits per second. Great values. We can go for the bit rate. Now, the same problem is solved in another way by making the index, the core index graded manner, where you give maximum value for the, uh, maximum refractive index value for the optical fiber core axis. And uh, as you go from the axis to the radial, radially to the core cladding interface, refractive index is uh, uh, gradually decreasing. So you know the refractive index, as I told you, is a measure of the speed of light. If the refractive is very high, it means the speed is, is slow. That will be traveling at a lower speed. Therefore, the shortest path, which is the axial path, will be the slowest path, because refractive index there is the maximum. And the longest path, which is the higher order modes, they will be traveling faster, because refractive index is smaller there, in, on an average. And the lower order mode path will be also traveling in a, adjusting its speeds. So the net effect is that there is an equalization of the transit time. Every bit, one or zero, they will travel through the uh, with, uh, different, uh, even though it travels through different modes, the time of travel will be equalized. The transit time for a bit, one, zero, one, that bit uh, transit time will be equalized. So equalization of the uh, transit time is happening in a greater index multi-mode optical fiber, and therefore on an average it will be, it can be able, it doesn't, it can take, for example, one of the order gigabits per second. There's no bit interval requirement here. But here, invariably, there's a bit interval requirement. Now, let me, at this, in this context, speak about advantage Kochi. You know, Kochi is a, a very interesting city where we have uh, two intercontinental submarine information superhighways established based on step index single mode optical fibers makes its uh, landfall. Landfall means all the, more, most of the time these particular optical fiber cables will be traveling under sea. 
and it meets the land. That's what is called a land fall. These uh, optical fiber cables are respectively C, M, V, 3, and S, A, F, E. Two super highways. This is the name of the highway, name of the optical fiber constructor information superhighways are named like this. The first one you can see Southeast Asia, Middle East, Western Europe. It starts from Southeast Asia, Japan, and it travels to Middle East, Arabian countries, and reaches the Western Europe, reaching North Germany. You also see there is a third. In fact, there are four such superhighways in the same path, same route. So out of which this is the one of one of the important superhighways. And the second superhighway making its landfall in Kochi is safe. South Africa Far East. It starts from South Africa and reaches still Malaysia. So, Kochi is blessed with the two such uh, optical fiber hubs or optical fiber landfalls. So, almost 70% of data transfer happening in India is happening through these two superhighways. So, the, we have therefore very important role in the optical fiber or internet or www world wide web map. That is something we have to always keep in mind which is having a great advantage with respect to optical fiber connectivity. And I have told you in the very beginning, almost 90% of the communication happening in the world today is happening through the optical fiber. And the basis of this particular construction of this uh, optical fiber intercontinental submarine super information super highways is step index single mode optical fiber. It is generally costly, but at the same time, you can carry large amount of data. And not only you can, for example, we'll see that later on, that large number of uh, differing wavelengths, different channels can be passing a single optical fiber. Up to 160 channels can be accommodated to the single optical fiber. And not only that, you can carry the data in both directions in the optical fiber. So the amount of data a optical fiber can carry is amazing. And I repeat, Kochi is having a great advantage because, in the, uh, because we have two important submarine intercontinental information superhighways making its hubs in Kochi. Finally, uh, let's discuss about some of the applications of optical fibers. So far, we were mainly concentrating on one of the most important uh, applications of optical fibers, which is in the optical fiber communication. So the, as a communication system, every communication system, as we have already seen, will be having a transmitter, a receiver, and a cable or a, a channel connecting transmitter and receiver. And this is optical uh, data which we want to communicate. And therefore, the transmitter has a primary job of converting any information to optical information, which means optical bits, optical zeros and optical ones, on off information. Now, what is done is that any, any information given is first transformed into Electrical bits, electrical digits, electrical ones and electrical zero. I already told you electrical ones means high voltage and zero means low voltage. Now therefore, any information you want to communicate has to be first transformed into digitalized to zeros and ones. And that zero and ones is primarily connected to either to LED, which I've discussed, or to 
semiconductor laser. So, when the input of LED and laser is so connected, it will be also converted to optical information. LED will be on or laser will be on, off. So, that in any information, which is digital information will be translated into optical digital information, on off information. And that on off information will be fed to the optical fiber cable, we have discussed about it. And it will be carried to the receiver side. On the receiver side, you know, there should be some photo detectors. So, detectors we have already seen, they could be either PN junction photodiode or you can have pin photodiode. We have discussed all about them. There will be another versions also for the same. And the purpose here in the receiver side will be to convert the optical information, optical zeros and ones, to normal information. First electrical information, electrical zeros and ones will be converted and then it will be filtered, modified, everything is done to recover the original signal. So, this is what is called communication. The perfection of the communication is that what we receive at the end product of this particular all processes will be the exactly the original information. Then there is no information loss. So, that is the aim and a lot of work has been done to improve this and I have already told you 90 percent of the communication worldwide is happening through around 50,000 times it is said these optical fiber cables are winding around this globe creating a backbone for the WWW World Wide Web, all OFCs. So, they are making World Wide Web for communication. So, the communication is the most ultimate, absolutely important uh, application of optical fiber cables. I have not discussed everything about how transmitter works and receiver works. This will be discussed further in your individual uh, classes by professors. Now, the second major application of optical fiber cables is they are used in optical fiber sensors. You know, the optical fibers are, we have already seen, very small in size, maybe 250 micrometer in their size, and their weight is very small. And thirdly, they are insulate, insulating, electrically insulators. Application of these optical fiber cables is, as I have told you, it is optical fiber communication. Now, but that is not the only application. Optical fibers are very much used as a sensors also. You know, the advantage of optical fiber uh, fibers are that they are very small in size. The diameters are very small, maximum 250 a micrometer, but the core cladding together will be, you, know, you can reduce it further. The weight will be also very small. And electrically they are insulators. They are made, mainly made of glass, so they are electrically in, insulating. And they are uh, not allowing electromagnetic interference. And therefore, the communication through the optical fiber channels will be excellent and therefore, they could be excellently used as the optical fiber sensors. Now, when we speak about optical fiber sensors, you can use these optical fibers in two ways. Either you can have a passive optical fiber sensor or ex extrinsic optical fiber sensors, where you do not change any properties of the optical fiber, rather they are used just as the a channel for information, optical information. So, there are large number of applications like that. For example, you have optical fiber bundles, you have large number of optical fibers made into bundles and medically they are used as endoscopes. You can examine any part of your body, your stomach, your heart, passing this particular thing through your veins. So, this is endoscopes. 
or directly swallowing this, you can examine your stomach, for example. And you know, very uh, complicated measurements it can it can make. For example, when you're flying in an aeroplane, the temperature of the engine of the aeroplane is very important, and it's very difficult to measure. And therefore, you can put a sensor, uh, a bundle there, which will be carrying the information about the temperature, the thermal radiations it creates, and there will be outside the engine, there will be a, uh, a pyranometer, which will be giving you the information about the temperature of this particular uh, engine of the aircraft. Or another example, you can think about a transformer core, where the temperature is very critical, the transformer burning will happen if the temperature is crossing certain limit, and therefore you can put the same uh, cables there, optical fiber sensor cables in a passive manner, which will carry the information about the thermal uh, input, thermal radiation input, which will be telling you the temperature of this particular uh, core of the transformer. And you can think about a, a conveyor belt where many things are, Amazon, you know, many packets are sent, you can count the numbers, the counters in the conveyor belts you can uh, make passive sensors. So, Basically, the properties of the optical fibers are not changing in, in this measurement. But you can uh, make these optical fibers in an active mo manner also, intrinsic manner. So intrinsic sensors or active sensors can be made out of optical fibers where we change some parameters, some properties of the optical fiber for measurement. For example, we can change the intensity of the optical fiber, intensity of light passing through, so intensity can be lost, we have already seen, by attenuation losses, intensity losses. If you make the lot of bending for the optical fibers, intensity will be lost. So this allows you to use uh, these optical fibers as pressure sensors, when you, when you put weight, the pressure will be, the bending will be happening and the intensities will be lost and you can measure the, uh, the pressure or you can make acoustic senses, for example. Another property of the light is the pace of the light. You can change the paces for different measurements. For example, you can make gyro uh, scopes based on this idea. The polarization of the light, if you use polarized light, you can change the polarization of the light. And you can have current senses, for example. I'm not going to details uh, of different senses which are active sensors, which can be made out of optical fiber cables. You can surf in the internet and get details, or the, the, uh, the class of the teachers on this will be giving you uh, uh, more details. My purpose is to give an overview of things, and I'm, uh, I conclude uh, our session on the uh, fifth module. To conclude, we have seen three important uh, things here. We have started with the superconductivity, and then we came to uh, optonics or photonics, and then we came to the optical fiber, and the last two sessions are interconnected, because photonics is made for optical fiber cables, or in other words, photonics together with optical fiber cables makes this uh, optical fiber communication system and optical fiber sensors. Thank you so much.